All right, so my first uh, talk is gonna be on uh, just etiology, functional versus degenerative. I think everybody feels like they know this, but it's super important. Uh, I do have disclosures. I prostitute myself to all these companies, uh, uh, help them in various ways, but it doesn't really affect what I'm gonna say. Basically, primary and secondary MR in the guidelines, and they're two completely different diseases, so it's really important to think about them. And, in primary, or also known as organic MR, it's the leaflets are typically abnormal. Most commonly in our country, it's prolapse or flail leaflet myxomatous degeneration. And the valve makes the heart sick. Surgical valve repair is the gold standard for that. And there's no doubt about that. A little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, as far as secondary MR, it's much more complicated. The leaflets are relatively normal, uh, they, ju they just are tinted down in the LV by LV dilation and dysfunction, and surgery is only class 2B, level of evidence C, uh, except during cabbage, patient needs a cabbage anyway, and just recently COAPT showed this strong benefit of mitroclip in a subset of these patients. So when you're thinking about this and you're trying to figure out, am I dealing with primary or secondary MR, you need to do that and you need to put it on the ECHO report. It's no longer good enough to just say severe MR. You have to say why, what's going on. So the first step in that is to understand the Carpentier classification. This is from the great French sur surgeon, Alan Carpentier. And it's just type one is normal leaflet motion, type two is prolapse or flail. Well, it's really, he called it excessive leaflet motion. I suppose Sam would fit into that category. Uh, but it's mostly prolapse or flail. Type three, the leaflets are restricted, and in 3A, they're restricted in systole or diastole, and 3B, uh, actually in systole only. So if you think about what causes this, uh, type one could be endocarditis, a perforated leaflet, or a vegetation where the motion of the leaflets is okay. More commonly, it's a dilated annulus, and that's important to, th to know that, because if it's a dilated annulus, an annuloplasty ought to work, uh, and that's usually from a fib or even a restrictive cardiomyopathy where the atria and the annulus are dilated. Type two, prolapse, could be papillary muscle uh, rupture and acute MI, or could even be trauma. We had a guy in our clinic the other day that got kicked in the chest by a horse. He didn't know you're not supposed to walk behind the horse, uh, and he's got a flail leaflet. And then type three, rheumatic, lupus, or any other collagen vascular disease or inflammatory condition, there's a whole host of them, radiation, drugs, uh, and, and uh, then, you know, 3B is usually a dilated cardiomyopathy or an ischemic cardiomyopathy. And again, if you think in that way, you'll know what to do about it. Type 1, if it's AFib, you want to treat that, of course, but an annuloplasty ought to work in these patients. Type 2, you want to repair and not replace that valve. Um, replacement is a class 3 indication, harm in a patient who has a repairable valve, and you want to do it in a center of excellence, uh, and, and you want to do it minimally invasively. Uh, type 3A, there are some people in the world that can repair some of those cases, and, uh, but generally you're talking about an MVR. And then type 3B, you want to treat that patient with guideline-directed medical therapy, revascularization, and CRT if indicated. Surgery has not been proven, Mitroclip has been, just recently. And so the question becomes, what am I gonna do with that patient after all the medical therapy and all? CLIP, TMVR, others, we'll kind of get to that in a later talk. Um, importantly, as you're thinking about this and, and what you're gonna say, if you get the Carpentier class, and then you look at the leaflets, normal or abnormal, you can figure out whether they're primary or secondary or mixed. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward algorithm, easy to follow, but that needs to go on the ECHO report. And you need to be thinking about why there's something wrong with the valve. So let's talk first about primary or degenerative MR. This is in this Ogera paper that just came out. There are certain features that tell you that a durable surgical repair is likely. You have the thin leaflets, fibroelastic deficiency, flail. The flail is sort of isolated to P2. That's a repairable valve. That should not be replaced. If your surgeon at your institution can't repair this valve, send them somewhere else. Uh, you want to treat every patient like it's your own mom. Hopefully you like your mom. I want to help her, but that's really, you, you, you want to do the right thing for this patient, right? 
Um, in good hands, this is also a repairable valve. Now, uh, you know, the, there's multiple leaflets billowing. This is more of a, not really a Barlow's, but a form fruist of it, as David Adams likes to say. There's, a, you know, annulo uh, valvular disjunction here, and there's a lot of segments that are abnormal. But most mitral valve repair surgeons can fix this with no problem at all. And then there are some where it would be very difficult to fix when there's tons of calcium in the annulus and along the leaflets, the valve looks like this. Probably gonna be hard to get a good result with a repair. So you wanna think about those things as you're looking at the echo. And you know, here's a nice thin FED patient. Uh, you see the flail leaflet, the torn cord. You see it here, it's actually a different patient, but here you have A2 is flail, there's the torn cord. These are cases that you, know, you ought to be able to fix. I, I believe, and, and there are surgeons who would argue about this, but I believe this is the gold standard today. So this is one of my patients, um, young guy, there's his incision, a couple of chest tube incisions. He went home on day three, that's the surgical exposure. The MR is gone. Not only did he go home on day three, they, do, they, they basically do a block here for pain, and he's off pain meds and driving it a week. So, uh, I mean, we do almost all of our mitral valve repairs this way, and patients are out of the hospital quick, and they feel great, and that's the gold standard. <clears throat> now, if you go back to Serrano's paper, the thing about repair is it restores, repairs in the light blue, it restores your longevity to the line that it should be on if you'd never had any problem with your mitral valve. This is your actuarial survival. And so there are very few things in surgery that restore you to the same survival you would have had if you'd never had a disease. Cabbage certainly doesn't do that. Mitral valve repair does. Replacement, though, you have an earlier operative mortality and then the curve still diverged, so repair is much better than replacement. And yes, this is not observational. These are different patients. Uh, these are probably re repairable, non-repairable, maybe different diseases, but there have been multiple studies uh, that have shown that, in including some fairly recently uh, robotic and minimally invasive uh, studies that show the same thing. So then MitraClip comes along and, and is randomized against surgery. Well, MitraClip was safe. There are fewer transfusions than with surgery, but otherwise they were both pretty similar in safety. And MitraClip was effective in reducing MR to two plus, but surgery was better because it gets rid of MR. And so after that uh, study, the FDA approved it five years ago now, uh, and they approved it for symptomatic severe MR, MR three plus or greater, primary abnormality of the apparatus, so degenerative MR, so you need to be able to recognize that, right? And they have to be determined to be at prohibitive risk for surgery by a heart team that includes a mitral valve surgeon. And that's a really a, a critical point because surgery is still better than a mitral clip. So if you can have surgery and your surgeon can get them through, they should have surgery. If they can't, a mitral clip is a great option. And again, there are certain features that tell you that an edge-to-edge -edge clip is, is like, likely to be successful. And that really is the same as surgery. Thin leaflets, uh, prolapse uh, limited to, a, I mean, this is just a simple little triangular piece of P2. You put one clip on that, MR is gonna be very greatly uh, reduced. Uh, here's a case actually that we did that was much more challenging. This was a 89 year old guy, he's 92 now, and he actually had a flail uh, commissural leaflet uh, laterally and a flail uh, P3. And we ended up putting two clips here and one here and he's 92 and doing great. Uh, but this is not an easy case because all the cords live here. This is the jungle where you can get in trouble. So you kind of go in closed, open below, grab. There's some little tricks to it, but you can do these. And then this is one where you don't, you, you want to run, run away from this. When there's severe MAC uh, and, and the leaflets are stiff and thickened, you'll create mitral stenosis with the clip. You might get rid of the MR, but you'll get rid of the patient too. And so you want to avoid that. What about secondary MR? Again, the leaflets are pretty normal. They're tinted down in the ventricle. This is a ventricular problem. The mechanism has been well-defined by Bob Levine and colleagues. And when the LV becomes abnormal, the closing force that pushes the leaflets 
down is out of balance with the tethering force that holds them in place. So in a normal ventricle, these forces are balanced and the valve closes, there's no MR. As the ventricle dilates, closing force is diminished and the papillary muscles are displaced outwardly and apically, tethering the valve down in the ventricle and creates MR. Uh, so we know the mechanism of this. The question I have for you is, is this mitral valve prolapse? Now, every week in our mitral valve clinic, we see somebody sending us a patient like this saying this is prolapse, and it ain't. That's classic functional MR. The posterior leaflet looks like a diving board pointed at the ventricle. It's not moving. The anterior leaflet's right where it's supposed to be. And if the posterior leaflet wasn't stuck open, there wouldn't be leaking at all. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. So if you freeze it and look for a minute, here's the posterior leaflet pointed straight down. There's this seagull sign from a strut cord tugging on the anterior leaflet. But the anterior leaflet is right where it's supposed to be. It's in the ventricle. It's not up here in the, in the atrium. Remember, prolapse has to be two millimeters above this line in a long axis view. This is a four chamber view. It's not anywhere near that line. So that's not prolapse, and it's not mixed disease either. That's functional MR. There's a spectrum of functional MR, and I'm going to probably show this slide again in the next talk. This is really important to think about, and people don't think about it, and it's all jumbled up in the literature. But these are actually three ventricles that I pulled out of our core lab for um, the Cardia Band uh, mitral regurgitation device, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And if you look at this, this ventricle has an EF of 60 and a normal L in diastolic volume, uh, almost normal strain and, a, and basically a normal shape. This ventricle is over 300 cc's, EF of 20, it's globular, and in the middle you, you have sort of a, a split between those. I would argue that if you fix the MR in this patient, you still are stuck with a very bad ventricle that might get worse. You ought to think about an LVAD or a transplant or even hospice in patients way over on this end of the spectrum. On the other hand, patients over here, this guy had a little infrabasal infarct tethering P3 and lots of MR. And you look at this ventricle and say, this guy shouldn't be in heart failure. He's in heart failure because of MR. Fix the MR, this patient's going to get better. So even though this is secondary MR, it behaves like primary MR. And somewhere in the middle is a line where you're better off not fixing the MR, and somewhere in the middle is a sweet spot where fixing MR helps patients, and we really don't know because those patients are all jumbled up. Of course, there's more to that spectrum than just EF. It's also size and volume of the ventricle, sphericity and wall stress, forward versus regurgitant stroke volume, and even LA pressure volume and compliance, I would add. So the reason I'm pointing that out is is uh, we wrote this editorial, a, a bunch of us, a few years ago, screaming at the guidelines when they changed the definition of secondary MR. We pointed out there's no single value of regurgitant orifice area that tells you it's severe MR. It depends on the ventricle. So here's just an example. This is the Gorlin equation really plotted out. And these are just different levels of, of LV, LA pressure on these lines here. Here's EROA. Here's LV volume, and here's, you're looking at LV volume at an EF of 30 and a regurgitant fraction of 50%. If you have a small ventricle, an ERO of 0.2 will give you more than half your cardiac output going backwards. If you're in a ventricle in most heart failure trials in here around 200 to 250, an ERO of 0.3 would be severe. But if you have giant ventricles, you'd need an ERO of 0.4. Now, the beauty of an ERO of 0.4 is it doesn't matter what your ventricular size is, that's severe, that's very specific for severe MR. This number could be severe MR if you have a small ventricle, but it wouldn't be at a large ventricle, and it's important to understand that. So let me put it in different terms that makes, maybe make more sense to you than looking at that plot. Let's take two patients. Both have an ERO of 0.2, both have a regurgitant volume of 30. And remember, this was proposed as a, a new definition of severe MR, although that's been changed back. So this LV has a diastolic volume of 150, this one's 300. They both have an EF of 30, that gives them a total stroke volume of 45 and 90. If you subtract this regurgitant volume of 30 from the total stroke volume of 45, you got a forward stroke volume of 15. 
That patient needs a heart rate of 100 to have a cardiac output of 1.5 liters per minute. That patient is in trouble. And if you restore any of this regurgitant volume to forward stroke volume, you can greatly improve their cardiac output. In fact, the, you could almost triple it if you got all this 30 back, right? Although that wouldn't really happen because this would come down from 150 to 120 and there's reflex autonomic changes and all that, but you can help this patient. This patient, on the other hand, still has a forward stroke volume of 60. You know, at a heart rate of 70, they got a 4.2 liter cardiac output. So you're not gonna make a big difference fixing the MR in this patient like you are in this patient. And that's what that previous graph shows. And so you have to think beyond ERO and regurgitant volume and think about EF, LV volume, sphericity, LA pressure. You know, we take these, some of these people to the cath lab and their LA pressure's 10 without a V wave. You're gonna really help that patient fixing their MR? Or is that just a color Doppler problem? You have to think, okay? <clears throat> so, basically, that partly explains why Mitra FR and COAPT had different results. In Mitra FR, they had big ventricles, 135, that's a misprint, MLs, and less MR, ER a 0.31, but more than half of those had moderate MR and ERO less than 0.3 at these large ventricular sizes. COAPT had smaller LVs, 106. That's, I, I'll show you that later in another talk in more detail and much more MR. So there are different patient populations. Now, going back again, there's a, this is a meta-analysis in JAMA Cardiology that looked at 53 studies and almost 46,000 patients with secondary MR. And what you see here is that, yep, secondary MR is bad for you, period. But to, to summarize that, yes, it's true, an ERO of 0.2 and a regurgitant volume of 30 is associated with all-cause mortality. But that doesn't mean fixing it changes the mortality. And I think we learned that from these two trials. So <clears throat> does fixing an ERO of 0.2 and regurgitant volume of 30 improve mortality? No, Mitra FR showed that. It's an important trial because that, this, this was proposed as a new guideline and we, Mitra FR tested the hypothesis that treating that improves the patient. It doesn't. On the other hand, COAPT, <clears throat> unfortunately, when they wrote the paper in the New England Journal, they didn't say this. And, they, and the New England Journal editors and reviewers allowed them to call this severe MR. They should be spanked. Uh, <clears throat> it's not. It's, this is a trial of these numbers, and it didn't work. On the other hand, in COAPT, they took persistently severe symptomatic MR, three plus, which is 0.3 or more, in patients on optimally tolerated doses of guideline-directed medical therapy proven by an expert heart failure committee, and yeah, it improved mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Two different groups of patients on that spectrum of functional MR, which is very complicated. So primary MR is simple. You know, you have a flail leaflet, lots of MR, it's easy to tell. Surgeon can repair that, or if he can't, we can do a mitra clip. Pretty straightforward. This is much harder. Secondary MR, much harder. It's complicated. Uh, the, all this complexity needs to be looked at in great detail because all those details would determine what, what you're going to do in terms of therapy. Are you going to do a surgical or transcatheter approach, and which approach? And it may explain much of the difference between mitra fit or mitra FR and COAPT, although there are other, other differences in the trials that can come into play as well.